Back then, it was thought that the evil demons were lurking in the leaves of the sprouts, lettuces, and cabbage. Ah! Why are we doing that cross the bottom? There's demons in there! Ah! Oh my god, people in the past. F**k. Bunch of dummies. Ah, oh, friends! Welcome back to another episode of Business Place. This episode of Business Place is brought to you by what? Beardblaze.com. Yes, that's right. Blaze Beard Oils. My face on the front, or I mean someone who looks a lot like me and a lot of other generic bald YouTubers with beard and glasses, but trust me, this one is me. This is my own Blaze Beard Oil, my own brand of beard oil. You just take a few drops, you put it on your beard, and it does wonderful things, which I will explain later in this video. Let's get into it. What happens here is Danny writes me a script, the incredible fake facts from history that everyone believed were true. Take a really deep breath there, because for some reason I talked for a really long time without taking a breath. Danny writes me a script, I'm gonna read it and add some extra bit or whatever and talk about the glory that is Blaze Beard Oils, beardblaze.com. And uh, then Sam afterwards, hmm, it's gonna add in some fine vintage memes. Let us begin. We like to think we're so clever today. That's because we are, Danny! Especially me, your boy, the big brain. Sometimes my genius is it's almost frightening. As we look back with pity and horror at the grimly primitive conditions of yesteryear, when all those dumb fools thought the sun was drawn through the sky on a chariot pulled by a divine horse. Ah! The bloodletting was the miracle cure for every known ailment known to man. Ah! We can count ourselves fortunate not to have lived through such dark and ignorant times. Oh, I believe we are. I mean, there's still crazy people believe, like, like 5G causing COVID and all of that crazy ass shit. Although I feel that's died down lately. Is that because people became smarter? No. Because all the people who believe that, honestly, really f up. Absolutely. Allegedly. Sure. And we can breathe a sigh of relief to be alive and kicking in more enlightened, more, in a more enlightened modern world, boasting thrilling advances in medicine and space exploration, digital watches, mobile phones, selfie sticks, electric nasal trimmers. Of course, we often forget that in a couple of hundred years from now, the smug and superior people of tomorrow will be looking back at us with those same levels of pity and horror. Oh boy, will they. There's so much shit that is going to be like looked back on like, what were you up to? You used to fix what was wrong with you by actually cutting you open and shit. Holy shit. We just have like genetically engineered viruses, alter our DNA now so we don't get diseases. <laughs> the past was the worst. Shit. People got diseases. Ah, oh. you only you only lived eighty years, eighty some years. Oh my god, dude! <laughs> what an idiot! Oh, what a loser! Good. I can't wait to be frozen and wake up in that time. They'll be pondering how terrible it must have been to live in a time where surgeons were still ripping out tonsils and appendices without having the faintest idea how fundamentally important they are to the human body. <laughs> oh no, I've had my tonsils removed, Danny. They found out that's why your voice stops working when you hit 40, fact boy. Ah! My entire career and life's work ruined. The internet saved from my takeover. A time in which people still didn't realize that the universe only came into existence in the year 1907. A time in which people still didn't realize the shocking truth about fruit and vegetables. And a time when it was still considered perfectly acceptable to engage in hate speech against gingers without the risk of immediate execution. <laughs> ah, the joyous free world where we may insult the ginger people. Wait, I don't know, can we do that? I feel like insulting someone because of how they look is a little bit like, uh, is that, it would be passe, would be the right use of that? Would that be the word to use here? Like, that's a bit passe. It's not really entirely unacceptable yet, but it's definitely going that way. And about like fruits and vegetables, I do think like in a few hundred years, we're gonna be looking back and be like, we ate animals, like the living things that sometimes we have as pets, we just eat those. I'll be like, I think we're gonna look back at that and be like, that was a bit intense, wasn't it? And don't get me wrong, I'm no vegetarian. I love eating animals, but I am aware that it does feel a little bit wrong, doesn't it? Doesn't it? It does. It does. But it also feels so right. There is time if you act immediately. Procure as much bacon and hide it in as many locations as you can. Bacon. 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 So maybe we shouldn't be too condescending where we look back through the history books and snigger at all the ridiculous things that people used to accept as hard facts. Or, or Danny, or we could. 
I hope that's what we're doing today. Still, you sometimes wonder what on earth people might have been going through the heads of the. Still, you might wonder what on earth must have been going through the heads of some of these people. Those idiots. The little sperm people. Ooh! Sex education classes were a very different beast back in the classroom in the 18th century. Mr. Wag, there's one thing I remember about like sexual, sexual education at school. I remember it like the first day of the biology teacher. Or maybe we just studied reproduction in biology and then we had like other lessons about sexual education. That was it. But whatever. It was a biology lesson about sexual reproduction. And you know when you skip ahead in the textbook and you're like, eh, 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 other 13 year old, ah, ah, we're gonna be, ah, ah, ah. Quit touching yourself. And I remember this, there's a teacher. Um, I won't mention the name just because, I don't know, he was a great teacher, one of my favorite teachers from school. And he had this brilliant, like, uh, it was like a PowerPoint presentation, like PowerPoint 97 or whatever. And he'd click on it and it'd be like, first say, this is slugs. And it would like slugs. And then it would click it again and a picture of slugs mating would come up. And it'd be like dolphins. And a picture of like dolphins, maybe dolphins not, because that had been a bit graphic. But it was all these things that you couldn't really tell they were having sex. And then the last one was, Humans. <laughs> and then I can't remember what it, it wasn't. A, it was like, uh, you know, the generic, <laughs> like, image, you know, the biological image of it. And you're like, uh, with all the pointing things. Or maybe it was just like, no. <laughs> and it was like, everyone was like, what is he going to show us? What is he? Ah! I always remember that. And I liked it. Dirty mother. But we're back in the 18th century. Mr. Wagner would stand at the front of the class, scribbling curious pictures and diagrams on the chalkboard before turning around and singling out the delinquent child, Scruffy Beak. As he taps the chalk loudly on the board for emphasis, Mr. Wagner explains this is how each and every one of us begin our journey in life. Even you, Scruffy Beak, considering your performance at school this year, this is roughly your finest hour so far. Mr. Wagner, you savage. Holy sh in today's world, I feel like that child would go home, tell their parents what Mr. Wagner said to him, and Mr. Wagner would put on probation for making Mr. Beak or whatever his name was feel small. And I mean, I, I mean, that was too far, Mr. Wagner, but also, you shouldn't be punished for that at all. You, I mean, I mean, kids need, uh, you need to get a bit of a thick skin, don't you? Because you get out into the real world, and your boss is going to be like, honestly, that work is sh and you can't go home and tell your parents. <laughs> Can you? Can you? Unless your dad's king, then it's then you could probably do whatever you want, to be honest. Unless you're like your Kim Jong-un son going to school in North Korea and you're bottom of the class and the teacher's like, ah, oh, you know, Mr. Un. <laughs> what did Mr. Wagner say? Uh, this is each and every one of us, even you, Scruffy B, because here you're in school. And then Kim Jong-un like, execute him! And he, he would be executed and Mr. Un would now be the head of the class. He'd probably be teaching in the class, to be honest. <laughs> Isn't dictatorship awesome? Oh, good times. Yeah. Scruffy Bee looks at the chalkboard in bewilderment. Mr. Wagner had drawn lots of pictures of sperm containing super tiny people with heads and arms and legs and everything. Scruffy Bee. Oh, wait, is Mr. Wagner m made up? I thought this was a story from... I am not all over the place today. I recorded another business place before this and I was equally like, oh, what is going on? I'm just lost. <laughs> I think I might have some mental disease, either that or I'm tired because I have a young child. Mm, mm, mm. Mental disease. Scruffy Beak shakes his head in dismay and wishes that his parents could have afforded to send him to private school. Back in the 17th and 18th century, a great debate was raging between epigeneticists and the preformationists. The epigeneticists believe that an organism develops from a series of steps involving crucial uh, contributions in both male and female. Ah, this is why I've heard of epigeneticists and haven't heard of preformationists, because the latter turned out to be absolutely wrong. <laughs> Uh, for both male and female, although they weren't entirely clear as to the exact nature of those contributions. In contrast, the preformationists believe that humans arrived in a miniature, preformed state, hiding within the motile sperm, or spermatozoon. So the tiny children would inherit their entire genetic material from the male, while the female was essentially just an oven in which the micro-children would bake and grow until they're ready to come out. Am I right, Peter? No. Surprisingly, for a couple of centuries, the preformationists were winning the arguments. <laughs> One of them was called Peter! Uh, it was Pythagoras who hatched the first seeds of the idea, which were later expanded upon by Aristotle. 
But it wasn't until the 17th century that the idea gained more traction when scientists realized that the early microscopes could be used for something more practical than just fun novel, just a fun novelty gimmick, leading to the first discovery of the spermatozoon in 1677 by Dutch scientists Antony and scientist Antony van Leeuwenhoek. All right then. A few years later, Dutch microscopist, microscopist, is that what people who operate microscopes are called? Today I found out. Jan Swammerdam. Did he swim in a dam? Did he? And Italian biologist Marcello Malfig. The reason that the sperm cells are more likely to contain tiny but complete humans, all poised to be transmitted into the female's womb for incubation. The problem with early microscopes is that they were a bit shit. Some scientists later became convinced they could actually make out these tiny human forms under the microscope, and suddenly preformationism became a more credible and popular theory than silly old epigenesis, which lacked any clarity, reason, or evidence. Also, why would we need women to contribute to us? Am I right, Peter? Towards the end of the 18th century, speculation on the origins of human life appeared to turn briefly upside down with a new theory which suggested that the elusive spark of life was contained somewhere within the female body and the job of the sperm was simply to poke at it and wake it up from its slumber. So now it was being suggested that children inherit their entire genetic material from the female whilst the male just provides the prodding alarm clock. That sounds like some nonsense right there, doesn't it, Peter? <laughs> women being involved at all in the growth of new humans other than being just an oven for them to incubate in <laughs> nonsense peter isn't it am i right whoa what Preformationism was finally laid to rest in the 19th century following John Doughton's atomic theory of matter and more importantly proper microscopes which led to more detailed study of embryonic development and ultimately the proposal of the now universally accepted cell, cell theory by german physician theodore schwann who used his wang Whoa, what? Uh, it's rumored that Theodore's nickname at school was Scruffy Beak, and he knew all along that Mr. Wagner was just talking bollocks. What the f Scruffy Beak, Danny? Kangaroo Court. The topic of frivolous lawsuits often pops up in business plays. Oh boy, does it. And while we might poke fun at how much time gets wasted in American courts dealing with absurd cases, that's nothing. Nothing! Compared to the European courts of the 13th to 18th centuries who insisted on putting animals on trial, reasoning that animals should be held to the same moral standards as human, as human beings. That's some nonsense right there, isn't it? Even dogs don't get that now. Ah! And nor do they deserve it. These weren't just showcase trials either, where an animal, when an animal was put on the dock, the courtroom scene was very much the real deal, complete with the judge prosecutors, witnesses, a jury, and a defense attorney who would usually speak on behalf of the accused in those cases when the animal wasn't capable of speaking for itself, which was all of them. Pigs were the worst serial offenders, largely because they roamed around the streets in gangs, occasionally getting into fights, disturbing the peace, and chewing off the ears and noses of little kids. Holy shit. One poor porky was hanged in France in 1394 for being found guilty of the heinous crime of sacrilegiously eating consecrated wafers. I hope we got to eat him. Like, hang him, boys! And now get this bit roast out. <laughs> and he's like, oh no, Mr. Porky. Why did you drink that holy water? <laughs> You're so delicious. Oh, son of a bit, son of a bit, son of a bit, a bit, a gun. <laughs> you thought I was going to say, son of a bit, didn't you? <laughs> I wonder if the holy water made him taste. No, it didn't. It didn't make him taste better because holy water is absolutely just regular water in every way and it's not magical at all and it's all complete nonsense. Of course it is! Ugh. Ah. Uh, and in one deeply unfair ruling, an entire herd of pigs were sentenced to death in France in 1379 after three of them were found guilty of killing a little boy. All the other pigs in the herd were found guilty of being accomplices in the crime, as they uh, had let out piggy squeals during the attack, which apparently confirmed their approval of the murder. Thankfully, the rest of the herd was later pardoned by the, pardoned by the Duke of Burgundy. I'm like, just sounds like the village was hungry, doesn't it? <laughs> it's like, yeah, 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 what happens? They ate the boy. How many of them? All of them! <laughs> Kill them all! Get those beer roasts! It wasn't just pigs though. Cart cats were routinely executed in account of them being agents of the devil. Holy you can't even eat those. I mean, you could. It's a bit weird. And the subsequent decrease in the population of cats across Europe led to, holy sh we're killing a lot of cats. Uh, led to a new plague of rats that were also put on trial for spreading disease. An army of caterpillars was once summoned to court to the town of Lucerne in Switzerland after being accused of eating plants in a garden. Assume amazingly they didn't bother to turn up, leading to an order for the caterpillars to be excommunicated from the town. <laughs> Good luck with that. Get that raid. Psst, 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 not raid shadow legends or that might also work. But sometimes the courts showed more leniency to animals 
than to humans. In the city of Vin 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 in Paris in 1750, a man named Jacques Ferrand was accused of having sex with a female donkey, and both of them were charged with bestiality. Jacques Ferrand was found guilty and sentenced to death, but the female donkey was exonerated from blame after the townsfolk took time to submit a document to the court which suggested that the animal was the victim. Ah, and the donkey always proved herself in word and deed to be a creature of honesty and good virtue. In word? <laughs> Guys! The idea of putting animals on trial continued until as late as 1846. Holy sh**. Uh, by which time most European criminals is, excuse me. By which time most European criminal systems had decreed that animals lack moral agency and should have be held capable, culpable for criminal behavior. Makes sense. Does make sense. Let's just kill them. It's like a dog bites a baby. It's like, all right, all right. It's time to go to sleep now. Uh, but bearing in mind that many parts of the world now seem to be moving towards the concept of animals getting legally recognized as sentient beings capable of feeling pain and emotion. Ah, please. Maybe those wacky Europeans weren't too far wide of the mark. It just seems a bit much to expect animals to fully comprehend the silly laws and regulations and moral code of human beings and then adequately defend themselves in court. But then again, bearing in mind that we slaughter billions of innocent creatures every year without a trial, at least some of the animals from the olden days had a shot of getting off the hook. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's like now they don't get caught, they just get killed. Woo! Shit. Ah, yes, and now we must take a little break to talk about this fantastic invention, Beard Blaze. How did this come about? Well, a fan of this channel, about a. God, it's gotta be. It's gotta be almost a year ago, right? His name's Will. And he was like, Yo, Simon, you're making a joke about beauty products. It's like, you shouldn't do beauty products, that is clear. But what you should do is create something for that magnificent beard. And he was like, do you use beard oil? And I was like, oh boy, well, do I use beard oil? I got like three different types of beard oil that I was using. And so he was like, you should make your own. And I'm like, that sounds tight. I was like, who are you, Will? What qualifications do you have? And he's like, well, I've got this giant laboratory for making all sorts of crazy shit. I was like, okay, cool. This is actually made from, it's all like, um, what do you call it? Like organic. I mean, the literal ingredients of this are, this is the, uh, what is this for? This is the beard rough one, which I haven't opened yet because I don't actually have beard rough. Like it's like beard dandruff. Um, this one contains, this is the four ingredients. There's no weird in here. Apricot kernel oil, jojoba oil, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, castor oil, and cedarwood oil. That's it. That's the organic. I don't know if that's organic. There must be organic, right? There's no weird like E7987641 in there. Just good shit. And uh, Will sent me a bunch of samples. I tried them all out. We found the best ones. We made a range. There's the Beard Rough. Mine, the one I use is just the Basic Blaze, which is fantastic. Uh, all of these are available at beardblaze.com. There's no special code. There's no special discount because it's my site. And it's, we just felt, well, <laughs> we were like, let's just make it a fair price and let's put it in big bottles because all of the tiny beard oils I got before were like this big and they cost like $30. And so we made a big one. I think this is like 15 bucks. And we still make money on that because I'm a good capitalist in my heart. Um, but it's just, it's its really good stuff at a super reasonable price. It didn't seem that hard to do, so Will and I did it. You're welcome, beardblaze.com. Let's get back to it. Here's a really weird one, which kind of goes against the idea of laughing at those dumbasses from history. About 400 years ago, medical professionals of the time seemed more clued up on such pa uh, subject of baby pain than medical professionals of the 1980s. From the 17th century right up until the 1940s, it was generally believed that babies could feel the sensation of pain based on the reasoning that their fresh new skin and bodies were likely to be even more sensitive to pain than the tougher skin and bodies of older children and adults. That makes perfect sense, actually. But then in the 1940s, we changed our minds and settled on an alternative theory that babies were magically impervious to any sensation of pain at all. You could use them as a football and kick them down the streets and crawling through a field of landmines. <laughs> They're not going to survive it, though, are they? Or drop them from the top floor of the Empire State Building. Those superpower babies wouldn't feel a thing. More significantly, you could perform surgery on them without having to piss around with that pesky thing, anesthetics. And to be fair to the surgeon of the 1940s, they didn't have something against babies. Administering anesthetic to a young baby was a risky practice, which sometimes resulted in brain damage or cardiac arrest as the young body couldn't cope with the potency of the painkiller. This led surgeons to start questioning whether babies even really needed anesthetic at all. Studies from the 1940s found that babies didn't appear to react to being poked in the arms and legs with big pins. Holy <laughs> shit, was running that experiment. And it was felt from this point that babies just didn't have the neurological capability to experience pain. There's also the interesting thing of like, if you don't remember it, did it ever happen? I mean, obviously, yes, it happened, and your mind processed this pain. But if you forget it, like if you undergo like 
uh, there, there also I uh, might be wrong here and it's not obviously not here and it's not facts but I saw like with anesthesia like when you go under your body still feels pain but somehow it's blocked or like you don't remember it or something like that and the reason like that it's okay is like part of it is that you don't remember the pain or something like that so it's like if you don't remember it is that okay or is it like if it's horribly torturous in the moment and then you forget it, it's like it never happens. I don't know, what am I talking about? This doesn't even, I'm, I'm lost with my own train of thoughts. I've definitely got a brain disease. This solved a big problem, as for the next few decades, babies underwent routine surgical procedures without the need for anesthetic or pain relief or risk of serious after effects. If they squirmed around a bit, this was largely put down, such as naughty behavior. <laughs> In extreme cases, they were given muscle relaxants to help them calm down a bit, but considering the beliefs of the time, the surgeons could have saved Ty Burgess, knocking the babies out cold with a hammer. It wasn't until 1985 that a public campaign in the United States arose from the tragic circumstances regarding a baby called Jeffrey Lawson, who died shortly after undergoing heart surgery without anesthetic. Ah! Jeffrey's parents had been horrified to discover that baby had gone through such a traumatic operation without anesthetic, and this led to stories in the national press exposing that this was a routine procedure. Holy sh**. This in turn led to new independent medical studies which revealed that the idiots of the 17th century had it right all along. Babies were more sensitive to pain than adults, they just didn't have the capacity to visibly demonstrate it yet, and the trauma from pain suffered as a baby could lead to psychopsychological psycho problems in later life. Ah yes, that's the thing, is that even if you don't remember it, it's like your brain is like, hey, hey, remember how fucked up that was? You remember? And you're like, no, it's like, I remember! <laughs> so I'm gonna make you afraid for no reason! The American Academy of Pediatrics eventually declared it unethical to operate on babies without anesthetics in 1987. That is really not that long ago. That was when I was born. Although even today, many people are still under the mis misapprehension that babies are immune to pain. Still, my mum once reckons that she accidentally dropped me down the stairs when I was a baby and I can't remember it. I'm sure it's not done any long-term damage. And it could have been worse. She could have dropped me off the edges of the flat earth. Woof woof! Ah! Danny! Accidental buried evil. Oh, that doesn't say accidental at all. It says ancient. They're completely different words. <laughs> Should I even be making videos today? This <laughs> shit is off the rails. I have no idea why anybody would want to cook a Brussels sprout. Danny, I like Brussels sprouts. You just, I, I feel like the majority of people don't, but I find the kind of earthy taste really good. And also like they're healthy. So I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's good for me. And it somehow makes it taste better. Dirty mother. Back when I was a kid, I used to visit my granddad for dinner. He used to insist on putting a big pile of the damn things on my plate, even though I'd made my feelings on the devil's vegetable entirely clear. And he wouldn't let me leave the table until I'd eaten at least a few of them, which led to several minutes of overdramatic railing and retching on my part. I say it was overdramatic, but even today I'm haunted by the smell and taste of the US and UK's officially most hated vegetable, and just seeing one on my plate is enough to make me gag. Like millions of other, other old people in the Western world, my granddad always used to make a, a cross-shaped cut in the base of each and every sprout before tossing it into the pan. He once explained to me that this was a crucial step in preparation, as he makes the sprouts boil faster. Yeah, yeah, yeah! I think my parents used to do that when I was a kid, and then didn't they discover that it was complete nonsense? Like, no one does that anymore, right? But you never catch a professional chef cutting crosses into his sprouts, and it's likely that my granddad was one of the many people still unconsciously following a tradition dating back to medieval Britain, which has no roots at all in speeding up cooking time. Back then, it was thought that the evil demons were lurking in the leaves of the sprouts, lettuces, and cabbage. Ah! <laughs> Why are we doing that cross in the bottom? There's demons in there! Oh my god, people in the past. F**k. Bunch of dummies. What an idiot! Oh, what a loser! If you swallowed the demon, it would enter your body and inflict serious food poisoning upon that body, or at least we could give you a bellyache for the rest of the evening. So the chefs of the time cut Christian symbol of the cross into the base of vegetables to drive out the evil spirits from the leaves and make them fit for human consumption is a bit like a quick exorcism without all the shouting and mucking about. Oh sh**. An alternative theory on why some people still cut crosses into their evil green fart dumplings today is because they're following a tradition established by St. Patrick, the patron saint of Ireland. Although early illustrations, St. Patrick seemed to depict him holding a shamrock, which would go on to be recognized as the badge of Ireland, the Celticists believed that he was actually blessing a sprout with a Celtic cross carved into it. In which case, the sprout should be the real national symbol of Ireland. I'd probably go with the first evil spirit theory though, which by the way has never been scientifically debunked and all of all the fake facts dispute discussed in this video, I reckon this one has the most chance of being true. 
that they're actually exercising evil demons from Brussels spouts and putting a Jesus cross on the bottom. All right, Danster, if you say so. Incidentally, if you're mad enough to cook a Brussels sprout, you don't Chris, uh, cut across into the base of it. This just makes them soggy and waterlogged. So that's more deception right there. And from this most fiendish of vegetables, you can never win. You can never win with sprouts. I'll just leave them well alone, like I have ever since I grew old enough to decide what I eat from my own plate. Deal with it, Grandad. Yeah, I have to say, like one of the greatest things about being an adult is that like, you can just, just. There's some things that I still just absolutely appreciate. I'm like in my mid 30s now. And it's like, there's things I just appreciate about being an adult still. Just going to the supermarket and just be like, I can buy anything I f want. Buy anything. You can go into that store and you'd be like, I want a f***ing tub of ice cream right now. Just do it. Just do it. You can do it. You're an adult man. Whereas a kid, you'd be like, begging, please, can we get chocolate? Please, please, please. And your parents being like, no. And you're like, ah, please. So what do you want to have for dinner tonight? Anything I f***ing want. I'm an adult man. It's great. Like, what am I going to have for lunch today? Anything I want and it will be brought to me from anywhere in this city. And fed to me and said, what do I want? And you just name anything you want. Chicken burger f***ing arrives. You want some sweet potato fries with that? It arrives. It was amazing. I wouldn't eat such an unhealthy thing because now it's like, rather than worrying about like the fact that you don't have your own agency and can't purchase whatever you want, now it's like, yeah, yeah, I can eat whatever I want. But if I eat that type of ice cream, I'm going to become fat f***ing, aren't I? Ah, oh, it's the worst. Maternal impression. Between the 16th and the 19th centuries, pregnant women had to be careful about what they saw, what they felt, and what they were thinking about. Just the slightest rogue thought or regretful glimpse could apparently result in their baby suffering from a birth defect or congenital disorder based on their experience. Uh, okay. The theory of maternal impression has been knocking around in various forms for thousands of years, but grew particularly fashionable in Europe from the 16th century, when doctors believed that pregnant women's thoughts or imagination could be transmitted directly to the developing foetus. A fetus, I know it's fetus, but it is spelled weird, isn't it? Uh, and possibly lead to what was described as monstrous births. Mm, mm. Probably less to do with what they're seeing and more to do with what they're consuming. For example, a newborn baby with webbed fingers or toes was often put down to the mother being startled by a frog during a pregnancy. <laughs> so silly. Oh man, I feel like wow. Or a newborn baby sporting a big beard and wearing spectacles could easily be explained by the mother having watched far too many Simon Whistler videos on YouTube. Truth. Truth! One of the most famous examples relates to Joseph Merrick, otherwise known as the Elephant Man. Joseph's severe deformities were widely believed to have been caused by his mother experiencing a terrifying encounter with an elephant while she was pregnant. This might have made more sense if Joseph Merrick had actually looked anything remotely like an elephant, although the rubbish nickname was inspired by the texture of his skin, it's not like he had big floppy ears or a trunk or anything. Thankfully, the development of modern genetic theory meant the idea of maternal impression had largely got been abandoned by the early 20th century. But maternal impression certainly spawned some curious Curious cases over the centuries. Most intriguing of all was the case of Mary Toft, a servant from Goldowning in Surrey. God at Godalming in Surrey. I don't know the weird name of a place. After suffering a miscarriage in 1726, Mary later claimed that she couldn't stop giving birth to dead rabbits and various animal parts. Oh, I know this. I think I've made a video about this somewhere else. But she didn't. And she was convinced that she had been briefly startled by a rabbit after falling pregnant. If it, it may sound silly, but she persuaded several distinguished doctors and medical experts that her story was true. Local obstetrician John Howard was one of the first to witness Mary's long chain of miraculous bunny births. Over a period of several weeks, he successfully managed to help. Uh, he successfully helped Mary to deliver a rabbit's head, nine dead baby rabbits, the legs of a cat, and the backbone of an eel. Mary must have been going through some proper weird sh during her pregnancy. They say the child was monstrous. Twisted, he was scaled like a lizard, blind, with leather wings like the wings of a bat. Mary was putting some proper weird sh where yeah that or that that yeah yeah. The story grabbed the national headlines for a while and even attracted the interest of King George the First. King George, <laughs> you weirdo, <laughs> off with his head. Uh, who sent his own surgeons and representatives to see if Mary see Mary to find out what was going on. Suspicions were eventually raised when it was noted that Mary's husband's shopping list regularly included a surprisingly high volume of dead baby rabbits. <laughs> Weird. A deeper, a deeper examination of Mary's delivered rabbits was found that they had air in their lungs and stool containing straw and grass, ingredients not usually found in the womb. <laughs> no sh 
Upon the threat of a very painful operation, Mary eventually admitted that the whole thing had been a hoax. She had sought to escape a servant's life of poverty by achieving global fame with her freaky birth circus act and had resorted to shoving a bunch of dead animal parts off herself before allowing a long chain of physicians to apparently deliver them. Dude. And also, like, back in the day, when was this? When was this? 1700s? Infection was gonna be a thing, Mary. Uh, she was charged with being an abominable cheat and imposter in pretending to be uh, delivered of several monstrous births and sent to Tothill Fields prison. Holy sh**. She was in prison? But possibly in the interest of avoiding any further embarrassment to the establishment, the case was brushed under the carpet, the charge was dropped, and she was released to live the rest of her life in relative obscurity. Mary Toff died in 1763 at the relatively ripe old age of 62. Yeah, it was probably good back in the 1700s. Uh, she is survived by the back half of a badger, a pig's trotter, and a bag of goldfish. Oh, but a this episode of Business Blaze was brought to you by what? Beardblaze, beardblaze.com. Thank you very much for watching. If you'd like to get some merch, you can go to purchthemerch.co. There's the 5G BB. Uh, I, don't, I don't know about this t-shirt. It's it's really random and... I mean, print on demand allows you to just be like, yeah, yeah, I got a random idea for a shirt. Go on, then. <laughs> it's not like I'm investing in 10,000 shirt units that I'm never going to sell. So I'm like, fuck, stupid idea. Boom. Buy this and I'll do more stupid with my life. Thank you for watching. Oh, son of a bitty, son of a bitty, son of a bitty, gun.